Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for our virtual Coffee and Cranes presentation. My name is Tanya Mickelson and I'm the events manager at Columbia Land Trust. We're so excited. We have over 200 people registered for today's virtual presentation and it just wouldn't be possible to take that big of a group out to Cranes Landing. Um, so we're really excited to share our work with you and thanks for joining us today. Before I participate in, uh, before I introduce our program, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. Um, this is a Zoom webinar, so as attendees, you will be muted and you will be um, off of video for the entirety of the presentation. However, you can use the chat feature or the Q&A box to um, communicate with us or ask any questions. Um, at any time during today's uh, event, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions um, to our presenter. To do so, simply type your question into the Q&A box found on the Zoom control panel. As time allows, we will address as many of the questions as we can get to during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we will do our best to answer any remaining questions in our follow-up um, email after the event. We will be recording today's webinar, and we will also share that link out with you as well. Um, I'd like to take a moment today to acknowledge the traditional stewards of the land we're going to be talking about. Um, I also like to acknowledge the resiliency of indigenous people and that no matter where you're tuning in from today, you are on native land. Um, for those of you that are new to Columbia Land Trust, uh, we are a nonprofit organization um, that conserves and cares for the vital lands, waters, and wildlife of the Columbia River region through sound science and strong relationships. We work with willing landowners uh, to either buy land outright or to help them place a conservation easement on their property. Our positive relationship-based approach has helped us become one of the most respected land trusts in the country. And to date, we have conserved more than 50,000 acres and have over 3,700 supporters. Our work region now encompasses two states, Oregon and Washington, and 15,000 square miles around the Columbia River and its many tributaries in an area stretching from the Dalles all the way to the Pacific Ocean. I'd now like to introduce uh, today's presenter um, for our Crane's uh, presentation, and that's Columbia Land Trust Natural Area Manager, Dan Fries. For nearly 26 years, Dan has studied Washington's plants and animals from alpine forests to meadows and desert shrub step, and even coastal estuaries. So welcome, Dan Fries. Okay, does everybody hear me? Am I on? All right, uh, wow. Uh, this is usually I'm used to doing uh, field tours uh, out on the site and getting in the dirt and walking around the crops and look at birds up close with people. So this is a new one for me, but 2020, we are in a new um, year with a lot of uh, bizarre things happening. So I hope everybody out there is staying safe and we'll get this through this together and uh, hopefully next year we can get out and do some crane tours um, on the site. Um, Tanya did a great job of introducing me. Um, I've been pretty much chasing critters around ever since I can remember following my dad in his footsteps through his work as a biologist for the state of Washington. And uh, I just loved, loved what he did and continued to work through that. And I got my degree couple degrees in uh, 1995 through Washington State University as a through management and biology. And so through my career, I've always worn a couple hats. I, I like, I prefer the management hat more than the biological hat, but I like to use them both. And this property allows me to use those. Um, and through the presentation, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and I can't do this alone. So I'll be thinking a lot of people as I go through and one right up the get-go is the land trust for putting on this presentation, as well as the land trust uh, giving me another opportunity to work with them. I had my first tour of duty with the land trust back in 2010 through 2014. And then I was hired back on uh, solely to, to manage this crane property based on my experiences. So thanks to, to Ian Sinks, my uh, uh, supervisor, as well as the land trust and uh, a, a super thanks to my uh, loving partner, Amy. She puts up uh, with a lot of, not so many critters in the freezer and coming home a little bit later than I should and some muddy boots and smelly traps in the basement. So 
Um, she's wonderful and she helps me do the, the work I do for the land trust. All right, and so this is a great map, um, kind of shows kind of our area that we manage and monitor and do our work within the lower Columbia River as well, all the way up to the, pretty much past the Dalles a little bit. Um, and so thanks to, to Tanya and her crew for putting on this presentation and all the maps. My, the easy part for me is just coming on and talking to you folks. So, and she did a great job of putting, there's a star right there um, close to Vancouver. And that's where Crane's Landing is. And you can kind of get the context of where it is in the landscape. And what is great about this site, it's within the city limits of Vancouver. And it's one of the most unique areas of having this large property to manage for Sandhill Cranes actually in the city limits. And so there's like almost 2 million people really close to this uh, project site that can come and not travel too far to see thousands of cranes. So this is a good photo uh, to show kind of the proximity of that. All right, this is another good map. What we're doing is like each, each one of these slides, I could probably talk a whole webinar on, but I'll try to just do the best I can to give you some good insight of what's going on. But you can see the land trust property there highlighted in yellow. And you can see right to the left of it, that's the Columbia River. And you go downstream, little, upstream a little bit, I'm sorry. And you can see the mouth of the Willamette. And to the right is Vancouver Lake. And Sabi Island is right across the river. So that's Oregon, just right across the river. It's basically a stone throw. And then you've got uh, Sturgeon Lake, the big lake you see up in the left-hand corner there. Um, but what it does is this is kind of a crane's eye view and it kind of shows you a lot of the habitats requirements they need for roosting, for migration and for foraging. So cranes landing within the proximity of all this provides great foraging habitat. It doesn't provide roosting habitat but they have roosting habitat in close proximity, but it's a great spot for them to come and spend the day to, to forage and loaf and rest and to get their energy reserves back up so they can go back north and make nests and raise colts and then come back down. All right, so these are great photos of kind of what the historic landscape used to look like in the close proximity to, to Crane's Landing. You had you know, upland rolling grassland meadows of oaks, and then the lowland valleys were seasonal and semi-permanent and some permanent wetlands. So the permanent wetlands you see predators leave those roost sites and then they go forage in upland areas. And so in the past they had native vegetation and tubers and grubs and acorns and they had a lot of natural food to, to forage on. And so as uh, development started um, within the lower Columbia River, as well as the Willamette Valley. Uh, this is kind of how some of the habitat was lost. And so, you know, in the 40s, the Columbia River was diked with large levees for flood control, as well as, as, well as to allow uh, farmers and industry and development to, to, to stay um, non-inundated uh, from flooding events. So that, what happened with that is we lost a lot of natural habitat for the cranes. and. Uh, if you think this is the Salem area in the Willamette Valley, there's about 600,000 acres of, of suitable habitat for cranes and over 60% of that's been lost. And same in the lower Columbia River estuary. And when I say estuary, estuary is basically from the mouth of the Columbia um, near Astoria where I'm talking to you now, all the way up to uh, Bonneville Dam. That's, that area is tidal, so we consider that the estuary. So we've lost about 73% of the wetlands in the lower Columbia River estuary, as well as within the Willamette Valley. And the Sandhill Cranes population, um, starting around the late 1800s through when they really, the managers really took a, a notice of CCs was declining. Uh, 
in the mid uh, 70s and 80s due to habitat loss, as you see, and market hunting was one, as well as hunting on their uh, wintering grounds, as well as hunting on their uh, breeding grounds. So the US Fish and Wildlife Service manages this species and is considered a game bird, actually. Um, it is hunted in the United States. It's hunted in the, in, uh, through the Mississippi River Valley as well as down into Texas, but they're not allowed to be uh, hunted on the, on the West Coast where these cranes are that we manage. And a lot of this information, um, I think Gary Ivey, he's been helpful providing a lot of this information for me. And he works for International Crown Foundation. So I would suggest uh, going online and looking at some of the work that he's done. He's been helpful with this project as well. All right, so here's a good um, overview picture of Crane's Landing, basically back in the early 1980s. And we talked about how the land was kind of perverted. And this is, this was an example of that in the left picture you see in the background, that's Vancouver Lake. And there's a little island there and that's actually dredge spoils there. But you can see Crane's Landing where that cursor is going right now, where all the water is, that's Crane's Landing right now. And that's what we uh, manage and grow crops for Crane's in. And Tanya's circling around a containment levy that actually built, uh, it goes all the way around the property and the Vancouver Lake itself was dredged and deepened. And you can see that vertical up and down body water connecting the Columbia River to uh, Vancouver Lake. It's called the Flushing Channel. And so the idea was to get uh, water into Vancouver Lake to kind of to restore some hydrology as well as to improve water quality. But all that material had to go somewhere. And so what it did is it, it was pumped into Crane's Landing. And so over 5 million cubic yards is into Crane's Landing, which is almost about 80% of the footprint of what we farm is basically the bottom land, the bottom of Vancouver Lake and the Flushing Channel. So as we go through the presentation, there's some other slides just to keep in mind um, what you see right here. And, and the left's a good, the right photo is a good one too, because it shows you the Columbia River, how close we are to it, as well as behind it is Savi Island and Sturgeon Lake. And so this is a, a kind of a great photo of, of now as managers and biologists, this is what we have to work with to, to benefit sandhill cranes. All right, so this is, this is my, my favorite part is I get to wear my manager hat, which I love to do. Uh, and so what we do here is this is, to 2020 is the fifth year that we've had a farming plans. And so farming plans, um, I refer to them, they're basically menus is what I like to tell people. They're menus that we plant for the cranes and then we do intensive monitoring to see how they react. How do they move about the, the property based on the cropping that we do, based on the plants that we plant for them and the spacing, the everything and we, it's out there. And then we have intensive monitoring. We do it twice a week from dawn to dusk, and we just watch them and count them. And then an extra day during the week, uh, I have a, a, a staff member that just watches the cranes without counting them and just sees how they interact with the, the menu that we provided to them. So on the left, this was our starting, our starting, one of our starting points. And we planted a lot of corn back then, and we planted oats and peas and sorghum. And we just learned through those crops and how they were planted, that they particularly liked certain areas and others. And so today, we still are refining this menu, we're still changing it, and it's still going to continue to change. I, I was thinking about 10 years that we'll have a fairly good idea of what our menu should be for the cranes. But the biggest thing you can notice is that we've learned that cranes like to move. They need a lot of visual of the property for security reasons to see predators and things that would disturb them. And we're really learning that. And so all that pink you see is spring wheat that we planted and we harvested it. And so these are open areas now for them to see. And the white part is a good uh, topic point too because it's, it's a plant that's growing naturally on the site and it's called yellow nutsedge 
or it's called chufa is another name for it. And I got a, I think it's a little bit of an example of it. See if I can put this up to the camera. That's a just a regular old piece of popping corn. And so right here is a little, is a nut sedge nutlet that I dug up. So it's about the same size, but the cranes love it. But it does get pretty big. I, I found one the other day, and this is about the size of a dime. So this uh, nut sedge is full of great uh, uh, lipids. It's full of nice fats and uh, sugars, good carbohydrate sugars. So it get, they get the fat they need to build up reserves for nesting and migration and then egg creation. And it gives them that jolt of energy through that really soluble glucose. And so they, they get the, the, the tubers and the worms and then the open area is what we're really finding out what they like. And so here we go. I, I, I let you uh, folks kind of make sure you put that vision in your head of Vancouver Lake when it was when it was dredged. And this is kind of how we as managers and biologists and all the crane folks get together and my contract farmer, we meet in a room and we just talk about what we saw, what the monitoring told us. And so we go in and we just plant these crops. And this is a new one you're looking at. Up to the left is, is corn and then the next lower crop is soybeans. This is the first year we've planted soybeans. So we're interested to see if how cranes use them. So those one of our big monitoring elements this year to see how they utilize soybeans. Will they eat the actual soybeans or they just probe around it with other uh, critters that are attracted to the soybeans. And then off to the right is also a, is a strip of alfalfa. So between the corn rows, the soybeans and the alfalfa, that's a hundred foot section. And we call those, so those are landing areas for the cranes to land in. And you can see, they can see all the way down and back to the side. So they feel comfortable and they can move about. So, and another thing about alfalfa is what we plant, we have about 50 acres of it, is it's a great nitrogen fixer. And so we're learning and I do soil samples every year. And it's amazing uh, how much nitrogen is actually pumped back in the soil through the establishment of alfalfa. And so what we'll do is we'll grow those for a while and then we'll rotate them out and plant corn in them. And then we won't have to use as much fertilizer and probably none at all. But keep, keep another thing to keep in mind is that strip of alfalfa and I'll touch on that later in the presentation. Okay, these are great. Uh, these are gonna, there's a series of three videos and instead of me kind of describing behaviors of cranes or kind of what they look like, these are videos that I was able to set up on a post and captured 60 seconds of, of live video of cranes. And so they're just fun to watch and how they behave and probe around. And this is an, also another example of, you can see the wetland behind it. We don't plant that wetland anymore. Uh, for the first couple of years, we planted corn over it, but now we just leave it open because we know the cranes like to come in there and, and uh, loaf and uh, forage for inverts. So another thing in mind too is, is a theme through this presentation is this property provides a lot more uh, benefits to just sandhill cranes. So when you're watching it, you're gonna see tons of snow geese, you're gonna see dabbling ducks in the pond there. And you're going to see a lot of, uh, uh, if I didn't say snow geese, but Canada geese and ducks. So we'll go ahead and there's a series of three videos. And uh, I'll talk a little bit on the first couple because the volume's not all that high. But And so one thing I like to look at is how they probe. And so we are learning a lot that a lot of the foraging they like to do out here is probing for grubs. And right now they're looking for... Um, worms. And the other day when I was digging up nut sedge, I found a lot of cut worms. And there's almost worms in every shovel uh, test I pull up, there's worms in it. So we believe they're uh, going after invertebrates. And you can see how open it is. So they like that openness in their ability to, to move and uh, continue to, to forage. Ooh, there's some good sound.
so what they're foraging right now is, is a field of alfalfa. And again, this is another field of alfalfa that they're foraging in. And so before this, before this next one goes, there's, there's one thing to pay uh, particular attention to through calls as well as a site is the adult sandhill cranes, they have a nice, really bright red cap. And then the first year birds or the, the, the young ones, which are called colts, they lack that, that red cap. And it takes about three or five years for a colt to, to mature enough to, to, to mate and raise uh, colts themselves. And another thing to listen for is you hear that really deep call. Those are the adults, but then you hear this high pitch kind of whistle. That whistle is the colts. So they're still developing their, their, their voices to, to have that deeper call. That was a great video. I always, I don't know if anybody saw that big old tanker ship in the background. That's always funny. People are like, whoa, what's that? But the Columbia River is just right there. So it's always kind of a, a kind of a funny thing to see when you're out there. All right, so this, this is kind of um, an example of our cropping right now. And you can see where the cranes are standing right now is a harvested field of spring wheat. And to the left is a standing crop of alfalfa. And then you can see the corn to the left as, a, as well as corn to the right. So Keith got this video a couple weeks ago or a week, no more than a week ago. And it shows what's important as our monitoring efforts as well as our management efforts of trying to get these birds to maximize as much of the property as possible because there's about 410 acres that we can farm. And so as I kind of mentioned with the, the foraging habitat diminishing within uh, the lower Columbia River, we have to do our best to maximize as much of this property for crane use. And so at the beginning, we planted corn in 100 foot rows for a couple of years and on really tight centers. And then the following couple of years, we reduced the rows down to 50 feet. And then we reduced the rows uh, down this year to 25 feet. And you can see the corn row here on the left. This is a corn block. If you can picture the first year, it was 100 feet wide. Now we've shrunk it down to 25 feet. And what we did too is that we blocked every other corn planter box on the corn planter. And each corn row is on uh, 72 inch centers. So it allows that to open up more. It allows the corn to fall over easier. Uh, because we can't knock this corn over to, to get it on the ground for crane use or for other wildlife use because it's considered baiting. 
And baiting is something that you do to manipulate a grain crop or any crop to attract wildlife. Although we don't hunt here, we're so much in close proximity to other hunting areas that we would affect um, hunting on other properties. But the wind can blow it over and that's why we kind of plant some of the crops east to west. So we have prevailing south winds that come in and knock that corn over. And then we plant uh, corn on north to south. So the wind kind of gradually knocks it over, kind of a late forage for the cranes if they need it. And what we're finding is that we're gonna be planting corn probably for a long time because it does give them some energy early as well as late reserves as before they take off to migration. But it also gives them some emergency food because the first year we did this, we had a really bad snowstorm and a lot of the ground was covered with snow, but they were allowed to get some food resources off the corn. And here they go, they're moving through a big patch of harvested spring wheat and then they'll go through another small row of uh, corn and they can just move to the property. So we're finally getting that menu right and they're using a lot of the property that they haven't before. Okay, I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, there's about six subspecies of sandhill cranes in North America and in, in the lower United States here. And the ones we're gonna focus on is just the, the ones along the, this area right here along the coast. And I think the big one I like to, to tell folks on this one to keep in mind is the cranes are only here, the cranes are here for eight months of the year and they're only gone for four. And so it's makes it really important on how we manage the cranes landing property to maximize the use of the property, to maximize the food resources, to maximize their security so they can build their reserves. They can get their fat reserves up and get back north so they can build a nest in four months. They got to migrate about 1300 miles. They got to lay a couple eggs. They got to raise the colts. They got to feed the colts and get them back down in four months. So that's why it's really important that we really maximize the, the property to get them all ready to, to migrate back north to nest. So this kind of is a little bit of transition into the property is kind of a theme I was talking about it. The property provides a lot more um, and then just benefits the sandhill cranes. And there's somewhat of a term used. It, 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 I can just kind of be similar to, it's called an umbrella species. And so cranes are kind of our little umbrella species for cranes landing, but everything underneath it benefits a, a ton of other wildlife. It benefits the local communities. It benefits a lot of job creation through contractors I hire to, to manage this property, as well as gets the opportunities for uh, interns to come out and learn and survey and do work to see if they're interested in, in being a manager or a biologist. And it's just really close to Vancouver and Portland, like I mentioned. So it, it provides a lot of public use benefits, you know, as we manage for Sand Hill Cranes, but a lot of it feeds down. And this is an example of alfalfa field that a local dairy has been harvesting. Um, and they've got 188 tons of alfalfa off this, this year. And it, they take it to a local dairy to feed dairy cows. And then that milk goes to, to local families. And that way, they're not spending a lot of energy and going long distances to get a forage like this for alfalfa. It's my understanding that Crane's Landing is one of the few areas in the area that actually grows alfalfa. So it's, it's kind of a good feel project to have local dairies come in and cut alfalfa. And so this is, this is an example. There's Tyler, my great contract farmer in that combine. And he's a coog. That's a Washington State flag flying off the top. But we planted 220 acres of spring wheat this year. You know, it's decided around the table when we decided to make this menu. And the idea was to open it up and see what happened. But what we did is we harvested it and we, we got almost 300 tons of spring wheat this year. And some of it went to that dairy and then some of it went um, to uh, other local areas that take spring wheat. But what's cool about this is that Tyler was able to adjust his combine to make the harvest uh, not so clean. So what it did, it was allowed to spread waste seed behind the combine, which actually resprouted. And that resprouting uh, spring wheat was forage for snow geese and Canada geese, as well as a cover crop. 
So this is a this is another good way that the, the property is being used. And so this is this is an example of our another experiment. And these are windrows created through the spring wheat harvest. And so we're going to see, we're really going to monitor these windrows to see if, if, if mice go in there or other critters. And we're going to see if the cranes will move up and down these windrows and plug and probe to see if there's any kind of critters in there. And so we have a local beekeeper. He stores about 100 hives on the property, which is, it helps his business out. Um, it's a safe, secure location so they don't get vandalized and it helps pollinate local plants as, as well as uh, gives him the opportunity. He takes these down to California. And uh, so this is a great, another great opportunity provided at Crane's Landing. And I, there's about 30 acres of native forest uh, that I planted out here. And the forest is a native species and shrub. This is a red flowering currant and it tracks tons of insects and hummingbirds love it. And we were getting nesting birds in our, in our forested areas. And here's an example of a nest I found. It's, this is a white crown sparrow nest actually nesting in a red flowering current. And so there's 30 acres of the property that we can't farm. And so we, we planted it to native species, over 25 species that we planted out here. And we manage those areas for, uh, tons of other birds. There's about 78 to about 78 species of birds that I've recorded out here. So it's a lot of benefits to other species. And this is, this is my bi uh, biological hat I put on. And so as I talked about kind of the menu we're trying to figure out, this is one thing we're not quite sure uh, and we're studying it right now is small mammal use of the property. And this is a, a favorite of mine, I caught this little guy four times. I had traps set out six, six nights and six days in this little fella. He really took to the wad of peanut butter um, and oats that I'd put in, in this live trap right here. It's called a Sherman trap. You could open it on one end and they go inside of it and it closes and I just come and collect them and get some information off of them. But I, I got a good kick out of him because he, he really uh, took to the peanut butter. But so what we're learning is we're trying to figure out how small mammals are on the property and how they distribute from, remember those alfalfa patches? Those are our permanent crops. And those are our sources for small mammals. And so we're trying to figure out population densities and how those mammals move throughout the property. So I caught a hundred mice this year, and this is a deer mouse. And I got about 32 recaptures and four of them was this guy. But almost all but 10 or associated with alfalfa. So we've got a good idea that we got a good source of population of small mammals with the alfalfa. We just need to plant more permanent crops uh, such as grasses and more alfalfa to, to expand and kind of increase and spread out small mammals in the property. And we're really gonna watch this year to see if, if cranes really target uh, small mammals as a forage. Thank you so much, Dan. That was great. Um, we have a lot of really good questions. And so I'm just going to start. Um, so can you talk a little bit about when the cranes arrive um, in the yes. Vancouver area and when they leave? Yes, there's a lot of good questions. I should have touched on these in my presentation. But yes, they usually show up about the 1st of September. And they typically leave mid-April. And the joke is they kind of leave on tax day about April 15th. Um, and each year, I kind of meant we, we do a roost survey, and we do that roost survey about the second week of October, and it's coordinated by uh, Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge, which uh, actually was is a partner that helped uh, give me some of the traps to use. So thank you to them. Great. Um, do we make money on any of the crops that are farmed on uh, the Vancouver Lake Lowlands property. Yes, we do. We made some uh, revenue this year, but what it does is it goes right back into the property. It helps pay for the contract farmer. It helps pay for this, the supplies and it helps pay for um, monitoring and the biological surveys that I do. So all of it goes right back into the property. 
Is nut sedge local? Is that a native plant? Yes, it, it's 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 been thought to be a, a noxious weed for a long time, but the the discussion is kind of turning. It might be native. It was actually a Class B weed in Clark County for a long time, and now it's not considered that. Um, but it depends on what you just determine what is noxious. Um, if it grows where it needs to be, it's great. If it doesn't, it's not. My contract farmer hates it. And so because he, he farms elsewhere and it takes over his fields. So it's kind of a running joke that he's actually farming <laughs> this nut sedge where before he didn't like it, but um, it, it occurs naturally, yes. So do you want to talk a little bit about access to viewing cranes um, in this area? Because there, I know there are several ways for folks to get out there and view on their own. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about where those spots are and just kind of the general um, awareness that we want folks to keep in mind when they're crane viewing. Yes, so there's a, there's a great, um, the, the best time is to start heading down now, actually, um, mid-November through 1st of January is really when they target that nut sedge field I was talking about. And it's right adjacent to Frenchman's Bar Regional Park. And you're allowed to go over there and park and just watch them come in. And there's, there's a walking trail that's elevated along the Flushing Channel that gives you a good opportunity to, to, to view them as well there. Um, but the, I, the Frenchman's Bar is the best spot you can go, go view them. Um, we have a really good question here um, regarding the decision to farm active crops versus just letting the property grow back um, with native plants. So can you talk a little bit about why that decision was made and um, maybe some of the difference in benefits for farmed crops for cranes versus just regular native growth? Right, so that's, that's, that's a discussion we're having as we continue to uh, fine tune our uh, farming plan, we have really dialed down on the crops that we plant. Um, the thing with Crane's Landing too is it's been farmed for so long that it has a really bad weed problem. There's uh, there's a class A weed out there and a couple class B weeds that need to be managed and controlled. And so um, planting like alfalfa is a way for us to help control those class A species. But like I mentioned, those wetlands, we're going to continue to, to try to get natural food growing in there. Um, what discussions come up of um, artic uh, Jerusalem artichokes is one that we want to try to get established out there. We want to kind of ma maintain our wetlands a little better and to see if we can't have some wetland species growing out there. But um, absolutely, over the as we keep going, we're going to introduce other crops and other native plants to, to hopefully create a situation like that photo I showed you with those um, the natural prairies. And we do plant, we are planting a lot of oak trees around the edges. And so those oak trees over time will grow up and they'll provide some acorns for them, we hope. So absolutely, that's, that's something that we're definitely looking at all the time. Um, so in regards to the crops with har harvesting, we don't harvest any of those for like food consumption. They're mostly all harvested either specifically for the cranes or for animal feed. Is that correct? Uh, yes, prior to this year, we didn't harvest any of the, of the crops. Um, the corn would just fall over and the, the geese would eat it. But this year, it was the first year that we actually, we did harvest the spring wheat, which was sent off to uh, local buyers of spring wheat. And as well as to the local dairy, they bought some spring wheat to supplement their cattle feed. But prior to this year, everything we planted out there was just basically, we just left it for the cranes and the geese to, to consume. So um, thank you. Uh, so throughout the presentation, I know you mentioned, you touched on a couple other areas where this specific group of crane visits while they're down here in Richfield, um, Wildlife Refuge is one and also Savi Island. So um, we have a really great question here regarding um, for the folks that uh, are that live around Savi Island or who have adjacent farmland used by hundreds of cranes, do you have any plans to expand this program to other farmland or to provide guidance to other landowners on how they can support, support the cranes? Yes, so um, I, we do work actively with ODF&W 
and we exchange ideas on how their cropping works over there. And we've talked internally about expanding that, especially kind of up in, you know, uh, do you see if it would work up in the woodland bottoms and of planting crops like we do to benefit cranes? But we do, um, there's a manager at, at, at Oregon that we work with quite a bit and we kind of compare notes and he's, he's also one that comes over and he's part of our, we call it our crane working group. And so he's always participating. We talk about how his crops worked and how ours are working. And then we kind of keep working together on that. So it's, it's a collaborative effort and Richfield's involved as well, the refuge. So there's, there's always talks about it. Awesome, thank you. So there's a few questions here regarding the difference in um, what the sandhill cranes utilize uh, for food source and what other um, wintering birds, so the uh, Canada geese or the snow geese, do they compete for food at all or are they kind of taking over different areas of the crops? So the, the, the geese, um, snow geese and the Canada geese, they, they're more browsers. And so they really target um, the re-sprouting spring wheat and as well as the corn. Um, we don't see cranes eating corn as much as the geese do. Um, so, and then snow geese do probe a little bit into the ground, but you can see that the beak of that crane in the background, is, it's got dirt all over it. And so I try to tell folks is that the geese kind of graze on the top where the cranes are or down below. And so there's there's not that food resource competition as you would think. But what disturbances geese bring, I remember that video you saw where all the geese got up, the cranes are, they're really disturbed by high concentrations of geese because when they get disturbed, they're like, what's going on? And so that's kind of the disturbance level that geese provide to the cranes. But we're not seeing at this point that there's a competition of food resources between uh, ducks and geese uh, and cranes. Thank you. Um, so there are also several questions regarding kind of the breeding process for cranes. So an interesting question, do sandhill cranes mate for life? And can you also talk a little bit about um, where sandhill cranes have their nests and how um, they deal with fly the colts and when they fly um, after having their babies? Yes, so um, the cranes do mate for life. Um, and typically the, the, the cranes, they need uh, seasonal wetlands or semi-permanent wetlands. They need wetlands to build nests in. And they make them out of uh, vegetation that they bring in and it floats on the water. So that keeps away uh, ground predators to come in, but it doesn't keep away the aerial predators. So the adults work together and they actually um, incubate the nest together. And so one adult will incubate for two or three hours or four hours and the other one will come in. It's called nest exchanges. And so they incubate the eggs for a good month. And then what happens is that the, the colts will hatch and then they take those colts, which is a young crane, away from that nesting area and to a preferred uh, foraging area. So I've always talked tried to talk about the importance of all the habitats these cranes need. They need roosting sites, they need foraging sites, they need nesting sites, and they need sites that provide good foraging areas for colts to forage. And the, the adults defend these territories heavily against neighboring pairs. And, and you know, I've witnessed this up in Convoy Lake Refuge on the east side of watching uh, monitoring crane, greater sandhill cranes is what nests over there. And they defend all these territories. And so, and then those colts, they, they grow rapidly and they usually take off about September and the process starts all over again. Thank and you. And the, the species, I should have mentioned, the subspecies we have here is Canadian, but we do have three in the flyway. There's lesser graders and Canadians. And the ones we have at, at Crane's Landing are Canadian subspecies. Great. Um, so what are the main predators for this group of cranes? So the, the main predators are coyotes. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, it's kind of the whole wily e. coyote and the roadrunner. You, you can watch coyotes out there trying to, to, 
ambush cranes, but the, the cranes, if they, they could see him, uh, the, the coyote knows. And so they just kind of keep an eye on each other. But I was watching one uh, this year and it was trying to uh, get a big flock of Canada geese and it just wasn't doing very well. And the cranes were had their, they were looking at them. Um, and then I've noticed that they, they, uh, they react negatively to uh, bald eagles. So when a bald eagle comes by, the cranes get upset about it, but the geese always get upset with a bald eagle. So everybody gets up and then the cranes get up. And so, and then on the breeding grounds, they have other uh, predators um, as they defend their nest. I'm sure the fox, I'm, I'm guessing, and weasels uh, up north uh, for, for colts, and then a lot of aerial predators for, for on the colts, as well as coyotes on colts. But those are the two big that I've been seeing uh, but I haven't seen any um, success of coyote getting a, a sandhill crane. Um, so those videos that you showed us with the uh, 60 minute clips um, where it felt like we yeah. were right in there among the cranes, what uh, monitoring devices did you use for that? And are there any other monitoring devices that you use throughout the property to kind of um, keep tabs on them? Yeah, those are those are great. Those are just game cameras that hunters use and you have the capability. I just got them through Cabela's through their catalog and there's really cool features on them how you could set it up uh, to capture video or uh, still shots or uh, movement shots. And I just had four of them and put them on a, on a nice pole out there and they just, they're not too expensive. I think you can get them for about a hundred bucks. Um, but unfortunately, I had four of them stolen off that pole, so I lost about 30,000 pictures and probably, you know, a couple hundred videos. So I haven't put um, cameras back up out there again because they get they do get stolen. So you have to secure them the best you can. And then for other, other tools we use, we just use our eyeballs. That's mainly what I use out there. And we have uh, tele, uh, spotting scopes as well as binoculars uh, with our monitoring. So, great. Um, so I just want to recognize that we're at nine eighteen. We have a really great questions, but um, so I think we're okay to go a few minutes over our nine fifteen end time. We'll take a couple more questions, and then we'll do our best to get to the remaining questions um, and hopefully provide some answers to them in our follow up email, which will go out um, early next week. So. Um, when you talked a little bit about uh, the surveys that you're doing in regards to the little mammal populations, um, do you feel like, I mean, the farming out there isn't encouraging small mammals. And if you do see a high small mammal population, do you feel like that also encourages like some of the predators like the coyotes to um, move into the property more? Yes, uh, for sure. And uh, we do have a, a high population of coyotes out there right now. Um, but what I'm seeing though, what, and what we are, our monitors have seen over the years is that the coyotes and cranes are able to kind of coexist out there. And that's being uh, made even better because we're opening, remember we talked about opening that property up more than we did when we first started. So the cranes are allowed to have better views long distance and they can get, they can spot a coyote and the whole flock just watches them. And so having small mammals out there is not only benefits the sandhill cranes, but we got a large population of raptors. So there's quite a few uh, Northern Harriers that are out there. I've seen uh, short-eared owls that, that fly out there and roost on the site, so which is phenomenal. We have sharp shin hawks, Cooper's hawks, there's peregrine falcons. And so increasing the small mammal base will help the cranes, but it also helps all the other aerial predators out there. We even have, we have tons of kestrels, American kestrels on the site as well. So we love, we love to see um, more species using the property, but I don't see any um, negative effect of having an increased small mammal population with coyotes, as long as we keep that property open so the cranes have good views. Great. Um, so I think I'll just take one more question if that sounds good. Um, and there are a lot of questions in regards to the population numbers of mm -hmm. cranes. Um, 
So have you seen in your time at the land trust, have you seen those from year to year increasing, decreasing? Do you have any um, information in regards to the numbers that we see coming in? Yes, um, I'm not sure if I, if I touched on it, but we had that roost survey. I mentioned a roost survey that we conduct every second week of October. And it's a collaborative effort with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, a lot of volunteers, the Ridgefield National Wildlife Refuge and the Land Trust um, all uh, participate in it. And what we know is there's about eight or nine roost sites within the area from basically the mouth of the Lewis River woodland on down through uh, Vancouver Lake. And so there's about eight or nine folks that sit on these roost sites. And so when the cranes come in from the foraging, they always come to these traditional roost sites. And so there's an individual there counting the birds as they come in. So for over the last five years, well, we the, the survey has been going on for well over 20 years and the population continually is, is consistent. And uh, this year, um, I think they counted about 4,100 cranes that came in and about five years ago in 2016, they counted 4,800. And then there was a high year, I wanna say about uh, 2018, they counted 5,200 sandhill cranes. So that population number is staying consistent. It's not declining, as, which is great. And it's not increasing as, as much as we think either. Um, but there, there's a current management plan out there. And I, I just uh, touched on it yesterday and it's through the Fish and Wildlife Service. And their goal is to have about 20 to 25,000 sandhill cranes wintering in, in California. And they're consistently hitting that mark. So um, my guess is there'll be concerns if it drops below. And if it, if it goes over in big numbers, which is great, um, but it hasn't been there. So the population has been quite consistent for the last 10 to 15 years. Great. Um... Well, I think that is, um, there's so many great questions. It's really hard to cut this off, but we will do our best to um, answer uh, the remaining questions that we didn't get to in our presentation today um, and hopefully provide some more information and answers to those in our follow-up email um, on Monday. But before we uh, leave here, I just want to, again, thank everybody for joining us and starting your weekend with us. Um, uh, really thank you, Dan, for providing all the great information and facilitating this presentation. Um, support from donors and people like you really is what makes this work possible. And we are so, so grateful. Um, if you were inspired by Dan's work today, you can definitely make a gift at columbialantrist.org slash donate. Um, you can also visit our website for more upcoming virtual events, just like this one. Our next uh, presentation is Urban Wild, Columbia River Chum Salmon, which will be hosted by uh, our executive director, Glenn Lamb, on Wednesday, December 9th at 5.30 p.m. Um, we're gonna leave you today with a, one last video of Cranes Landing. Um, so feel free to stay on and um, watch this to send you on your way. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Thank you.